God, we have that hope. Though you give and though you take, you, your children, ne'er forsake. So, teach us this morning. Oh, just push, push that teaching deep into our hearts and souls. We, we humbly pray in Christ's name. Amen. Have you ever noticed how much our American English, I'm talking about American English, is peppered with bird idioms? You know what I'm talking about? We, 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 what, what are we talking about when we talk about a, 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 a night owl? <laughs> Looking for that other word. What are we talking about when we talk about a night owl? Yeah, we're talking about students at Andy's University. Burn the, burn the oil till early hours of the morning. What do we talk about? Because we use this all the time. Lucky duck. I mean, what's a lucky duck? Why would it ever be lucky to be a duck? <laughs> but we use it. We say, I got goosebumps. Don't we talk about goosebumps? Yeah. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. You know, I was noticing uh, these, these idioms, they're, they're really built around domesticated uh, fowls. It's because Americans, of all, the whole world has grown up around these birds all over the, the yard or the barnyard or whatever. Don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. I mean, we say, we say, we don't even know what we're saying. And I can't believe how many times I've said this. This is so absolutely mindless. Why would you ever say this in public? I want to kill two birds with one stone. You do? How awful of you. What are you thinking? Two birds with one stone. We say things. American English, peppered with it filled with these bird idioms. There's one bird idiom nobody wants to be called. Nobody wants, especially if you're a little boy, nobody wants to be called this. Chicken. Chicken and out, that's what you're doing. You're chicken and out on us. But it could be that the mother hen turns out to be the greatest calling of all. Open your Bible with me, please, to Matthew chapter 23, red letter words spoken by our Lord himself on the eve of his own death. And while we're looking for Matthew 23, let me flip it on the screen for you. Our little series in this month, five Sabbaths, unusually in this month, Gone to the Birds, Lessons from the Divine Ornithologist. Today is part three, part one, the eagle, part two, ravens, part three, you guessed it, the mother hen. Let's go. Open your Bible to Jesus' words, Matthew 23. I'm in the New International Version. You didn't bring a Bible, grab the pew Bible in front of you. It'll be a page number in that Bible. I just don't have it written down. Matthew chapter 23. Oh, the, 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 the deep emotion and pathos, as we say in American Greek, the pathos of Christ himself. Pick it up in verse 37, Matthew 23, verse 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you can feel it. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. There it is, the bird species for today. The Lord himself chooses the hen, the mother chicken, to describe his heartbroken love, not only for Jerusalem, but for particularly the leadership of Jerusalem who have been saying, no, 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 no. Today he gets it. Today he says, I know what you're saying to me. Hey, listen, Rabbi, which part of the no don't you understand? The N or the O. He's getting it. This is the final no. But unrequited love does not soon relinquish its passion. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you would not. Mother hen. I grew up with chickens in Japan. When we were living in the countryside, of course, chickens everywhere. In the city, once in a while, you'd hear uh, cock-a-doodle-doo. But in Japan, in fact, our pet cat, Tipper, God bless him, with all of his docile purring that we live with through the years, Tipper, in his old age, somehow, <laughs> we don't know what happened, but he killed a nearby Japanese farmer's chicken and then had the temerity to drop the carcass on our front door. 
When Tipper did it the second time, my parents, American missionaries, very sensitive to PR, said the cat has got to go. And with great wailing and tears, we climbed into our little Japanese car and drove to a place we'd never driven before, miles away, because we found a veterinarian who agreed he would euthanize Tipper. Wailing and crying all the way back home, that was it. Goodbye, Tipper. Which made all the more dramatic, by the way, that moment when my, mo my mother, who's been teaching some missionary kids piano, she's been teaching them piano, and so she's going to have a little recital for all the missionary kids in our little living room with all the parents and the children crowded. Tipper knew drama, and at that moment, the cat, muddied and bedraggled two weeks later, come stumbling into the room, and of course the place went berserk. And of course, we kept him. <laughs> Our new chicken-killing, runaway, come home hero, Tipper. I mean, how did he find the way? He, we had never been that way. These, these creatures. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You can, you can sense the heartache. How often I've longed to gather you like a hen gathers her little chickens. I've longed to just gather you close to me, but you would not come. But why hen? Why do you pick the metaphor hen on the eve of his own death? Hen. Perhaps because, you know, that little imagery, because the moment we say uh, mother hen and little yellow chickies, we can all see it. They're all running around. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And they all come under. We know. Maybe that's why. Perhaps, as, as Ke Craig Keener observes in his commentary, I'll put his words on the screen, perhaps this is the reason. Jewish tradition claimed that Jewish people were under God's wings, and when a Jewish person converted a neighbor, a Gentile neighbor, okay, so you're witnessing to your neighbor, and he converted a Gentile neighbor, or he or she brought that Gentile, quote, under the wings of God's presence. You could hardly have a more tender and poignant expression of solicitude one commentator says, You've never, nothing exceeds this from Jesus' lips. Desire of Ages describes this moment when he speaks these words. Desire of Ages is on the screen. By the way, there is a study guide today. You'll take all these quotes home. Desire of Ages on the screen. Divine pity marked the countenance of the Son of God as he cast one lingering look upon the temple and then upon his ears. You can just feel his heart, his heart pounding. This is it. One last shot. Keep reading in a voice choked. By deep anguish of heart and bitter tears, he exclaimed, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not keep reading. This is the separation struggle. In the lamentation of Christ, the very heart of God is pouring itself forth. It is the mysterious farewell of the long-suffering love of the deity. We get it. We get it. The leadership of this faith community says, you don't want us. You don't want me. I got it. Uh, this isn't just a mother hen anguishing over her chicks that refuse to come running to her for safety and protection. No, 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 no. This is a mother hen who knows that she is going to give her life for those chicks that will not come running. She will give his, her life. And the ultimate sacrifice in death, Jesus declares... I am the mother hen. Isn't that amazing? I am the mother hen. This isn't a chickening, chickening out of the Savior of the world. In fact, he knows that there is a chicken killing coming very soon, and he'll be the chicken. He's not chickening out. Through this very maternal image, and by the way, get this. This is as female as you can get with imagery. And God takes this female imagery and he says, that's me. I am the mother hen. Through this profound maternal imagery, the poignant, the, 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 the strong, refusing almost to let go love of God. There it is. We feel it. We sense it. How often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. 
Come on, guys. We're talking about, you want to talk about, you want to talk about a posture of protection? How could you be safer than under, the, under your mommy's wings? How could you be safer? You want to talk about a posture of intimacy? How could you be closer to your mother than under her wings? The child knows when she's with her mother. We just had our, our two little granddaughters with us from Oregon for eight days. Just put them on a plane yesterday along with their mother and father. We offered to keep the kids. I mean, Kirk and Chelsea, you can go home. Can we, can we keep Ella and uh, Isabel? Okay. But it was wonderful to have these two little girls running around our house. And you know what? When little four-month Isabel... We took everybody, we took everybody on the train, you got to do this, on the train to Shedd Aquarium this last week, okay? So Isabel's going in what's called a Snuggie, and you mothers know what a Snuggie is because you wear it on the front, and she is, she is bound to her mother's breast and heart. That little girl slept for five hours in that Snuggie while we walked all the way through Shedd Aquarium and had lunch. You know why she slept? You can't get any closer. You can't get any closer than that to your mommy. Whenever the girls called, they weren't calling daddy or papa. When they get up in the middle of the night, I could hear them. Mommy. They say, true story, they say that after these raging, bloody battles in the Civil War, often in the night with the corpses left, you could hear a cry of a young boy calling for his mother. Mother. What is there about a bond between a mother and a child that's not between a dad and a child? Jesus, on the eve of his death, says, I am the mother hen. I am the one that has desperately sought to draw you near while there is still time. Wow. When Jesus uses that I am the hen metaphor. I'll just promise you that he was thinking of a psalm. In fact, I assure you, he memorized the psalm at his mother's knee. The reason I know that is because the devil memorized the same psalm. And if the devil memorized the psalm and the Lord Jesus memorized the psalm, there must be something hugely potent in that psalm. And I'm going to show you what the devil does when he handles the psalm. Open your Bible now. We are in the New Testament. We go back to the Old. We're going to end in Psalm 91. This is the great protection psalm. This is the psalm that says when the earth is facing its last plagues, I will be there for you and you will be safe with me. This is that psalm. My mother, God bless her, Oh, she worked on us three kids every Friday night to, to memorize Psalm 91. Just kids, get it down. Psalm 91. Karen and I have spent years working on trying to memorize that psalm in the King James English. Psalm 91. It's, it's written for a community destined for apocalyptic meltdown. Now, listen. Apocalyptic meltdown. Now, I am watching and praying. I'm watching and praying for what's going on right now. I was praying for the success of that U.S.-North Korea summit that our president arranged a few days ago. I was praying for its success. And if you read my blog, you'll know why I was praying. I'm not going into that now. But I know and you know in our heart of hearts that the day is coming when what occurs on earth will be beyond human reversal. It will be the end game. Right? Yeah, you know that, I know that. It will be like what, what Paul was trying to describe. And th these, are, these words are really the setting for Psalm 91. Let's put Paul on the screen. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. For when they say peace and safety, hey, we got a breakthrough. We got it done. When they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. We know that that day is coming. Psalm 91 is for that day. Okay? Let's look at it now. Psalm 91. Here we go. Verse 1. Whoever, this is, the new, this is NIV, of course. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will arrest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will save the Lord. He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. What you don't know in reading it in the English is that the psalmist has inserted right here in the opening salvo four names for God. 
So we had to memorize this in the we had to memorize this in the King James. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. Most High is Elion in the Hebrew. Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Almighty is Shaddai in the Hebrew. I will say of the Lord, it's Yahweh. I will say of the Lord, the great covenant keeping creator God. I will say of the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, Elohim, my God in whom I trust. Four names. Whatever happens in this psalm comes from the four named God. Singular. Wow. I love the way one writer puts it. God's commandment keeping people stand under the broad shield of omnipotence in this psalm. This is good. Now you're ready for verse 3. The forenamed God. Here he goes now. Speaking of him, verse 3. Surely he, this forenamed God, will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. You know, it's very interesting to me anyway. The new translations... Why they hang on to this very old King James Shakespearean word, fowler. Whoever uses the word fowler today, we use the word bird hunter. Two words. But all the translations, the new ones, they all hang on to fowler. This isn't the only place it appears. Let me put another one on the screen for you. Psalm, what is this? Psalm 124, verse 7. We, is, we have escaped like a bird from the fowler's snare. The snare has been broken. And we little birdies have escaped. So obviously... The fowler's a bird hunter. But what were the ancient hunters like? I put a little paragraph from a Bible dictionary in your, in your notes. Don't look at it now. But uh, a fowler was a professional bird hunter before the day of firearms. You want to catch a bird, you, know, you don't do that. No. Fowlers used traps. They used nets. They used sticks. In fact, they used one stick, one and a half feet long, about like this, about a half inch wide, straight stick. And what they would do, particularly if they wanted ground-hugging birds like partridges or pheasants, what they would do is they would take this stick, and you know that when you throw a boomerang, what does it do? It goes around. This stick, they would take it, and if you throw it, and they would throw, throw it low, particularly when, they're, when they're, the birds are racing up a hill, they'll throw it low, so the stick comes, and if somebody comes behind you and you're standing up and they just go like this to you, it makes you feel like a fool because you're suddenly out of control. That's what the stick did. Boom, boom, boom. The birds go down, come running out of the bush. Everybody grab, 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 and they have their birds. That's what a fowler is. So here's the question. Is a fowler good news for a bird or bad news? Answer, answer, bad. As bad news as the devil himself. And that's exactly what's happening here. My, oh, my. So when Psalm 91, get this, when Psalm 91 declares he will save you from the fowler's snare, it immediately identifies you as a bird. You are a bird. I am a bird. The fowler is you know who. Evil. Evil. And evil with the D spells devil. Devil. That's the fowler. Satan himself. So number one, Psalm 91 tells us, guess what? You're the bird. And number two, Psalm 91 announces the urgently good news that there is a deliverer who can take down any fowler on this planet. Somebody can rescue us from the fowler. Good news. <laughs> Great news, I would say. <laughs> ah, we are the little chickies. That's Jesus' point. That's the psalmist's point. Bad times. Put it on the screen, please, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 12. Moreover, no one knows when their hour will come. No, we don't. As fish, are, as fish are caught in a cruel net or birds are taken in a snare, so people are trapped by evil times and fall unexpectedly under them. Evil times, trapped. Oh, we know the fowler. Who here has not felt the hot breath of the fowler taking his stick ready to cut your legs out from under you? We all know that breath. We know him. Patriarchs and prophets on the screen, the great mass of the world will reject God's mercy in the apocalyptic meltdown, which Psalm 91 is most poignantly, succinctly connected with. The great mass of the world will reject God's mercy and will be overwhelmed in swift and irretrievable ruin. But those who heed the warning shall dwell, here it comes, Psalm 91, in the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, end quote. But the big question is, how will God deliver us? How's he going to deliver us? Now, here comes the psalmist doing something you could not do in freshman composition. 
because the, the psalmist is going to do what is a no-no in literary, uh, uh, literary writing, and that is he's going to instantly mix metaphors. So the first metaphor is, you're the chick. You're the chick, and I'm the chick. Second metaphor, he's going to turn God into a chick, into a mother, into a hen. So you got two metaphors going. Ah, but he's making the point. In fact, so that we know this isn't a little slip-up, I want you first to read it here. This is uh, verse 3. We'll read verse 3 again. Surely he, the forenamed God, will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings. Speaking of this forenamed God, under his wings you will find refuge. That feels like a little typo. Well, they didn't really mean his feathers. He has feathers. No, it's not a typo. Let me show you just from the book of Psalms. Please put it on the screen. Psalm 17, verses 8 and 9. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. Under his wings. There it is. That's not isolated either. Look at Psalm 57, verse 1. Be merciful to me, O God. Be merciful to me, for my soul trusts in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will make my refuge until these calamities have passed by. The world is going to melt down one day, and here is a psalm that says, Psalm 91, here is a psalm that declares, I will shelter you under my feathers, and I'll save you. Wow. Mercy. The mother hen, that's precisely Jesus' point. That's precisely any way you want to slice it. That's his point. It's the point in Matthew 23. It's the point in Psalm 91. That's his point. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the devil knows it. <laughs> the devil knows the point of Psalm 91, which is why the devil does some major surgery. He who also has memorized Psalm 91 does some major surgery. I want to show this to you. This is absolutely unbelievable what he does. Okay, so picture the scene. Forty days of fasting and praying are over. This is day number 40. Standing before us now is this emaciated specimen of humanity. He's all bones. His cheeks are protruding. The bones are. And he's standing there, famished. Forty days of, and nights of prayer are now concluded. And guess what? Guess who shows up? This glorious, majestic, towering being of light who looks down at this emaciated soul and he says, oh, I just don't understand this. You can't, you cannot be who apparently you think you are. I mean, how could you? Look at you. Okay. By the way, the devil will always come to you on your 40th day. I'm telling you the truth. You know what the 40th day is? It's when you're the weakest physically. You'll never go 40 days of fasting. You can't do it. But it's when you're at your weakest physically. That's when the fowler shows up. I got this thing that's going to cut your legs out. Watch this. That's when he shows up, when you're physically at your weakest. But he learned from Jesus. He didn't know it before, but he knows it now. Well, sometimes when you're at your physical weakest, you are at your spiritual strongest. And Jesus was weak physically, but he was strong. And so when the devil spits that out, come on, boy, you're hungry, aren't you? I can tell. Look at your skin and bones. Turn those stones into bread. Right now. Do it. Jesus looks at that. And you know what Jesus does. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Isn't that what he said? Ah. Now the fowler, who himself is a bird... With his mighty talons, takes the Son of God, Son of Man, and he flies him high into the dark heavens and uh, deposits him on the top of a dizzying pinnacle. He says, all right. You like quoting scriptures, don't you? So do I. I have a scripture for you. I suggest that you throw yourself off of this because if God is your God and you are who you say you are and that voice at the river said you were, you just throw yourself off. You, you, you. He'll send his angels. And the devil quotes. Now, I want you to watch this. Put it on the screen, please. Matthew chapter 
4, verse 6. Temptation number 2. The devil says, for it is written. Where did he just hear that? He heard that from Jesus. I can play this game. For it is written. And now he quotes Psalm 91. Watch this. For it is written, Psalm 91. He, the forenamed God, will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift, up your, lift, lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You want to quote Scripture? I quoted Scripture. Ah, but notice what he does. I'm going to show you the real Psalm 91 now, and you'll see where the surgery is. For he, the forenamed God, will command his angels concerning you. Underline the part that the devil cut out, please. He cut that line out. That is the gut. That is the heart of the entire psalm. He cut it out. He skipped. And so he added an and. For he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up. Ah, you know why he cut it out? Because it's the secret to your victory against the fowler. And he doesn't want Jesus to be reminded of the secret. He cuts it out. But in the act of cutting it out, get this, Jesus, who learned this from knee high to a grasshopper, learned it his, on red alert, something's missing. Ah, he knew what was missing. And instantly, he now can identify who this being is, who would play cut and paste with the inspired Word of God. Wow. The devil has hated that truth. Put that truth on the screen, and boy, I wish, you, I wish there were a way that I could just hit, lock me in, Scotty, and psh, I'd lock that truth in your mind right now and never leave. Look at that sentence. Don't look at me. Look at that sentence. He will guard you in all your ways. The one line Satan was absolutely certain must not be introduced to Jesus. What he cut out, what he didn't want Jesus to know, he doesn't want you to know. So look at that line. Fool him. Memorize it. He will guard you in all your ways. That is the great, great truth of this mother hen bird metaphor. If last week's raven metaphor revealed the truth, God will provide, then this week's mother hen metaphor reveals the truth, God will protect. He will protect you. He will protect you. He will guard you in all your ways. Summon it into your, drop it into your memory and summon it up Day after day after day, I will put my trust in him, for he will guard me in all my ways. I will put my trust in him, for he will guard me in all my ways. Lock that line in, the one that Satan was hoping you will never remember. Lock it in, and you'll have the secret to why Jesus was victorious with the dark and dastardly fowler. He will guard. Me in all my ways, period, all my ways. And by the way, not just for mañana. I know this, this psalm is for mañana, but the meltdown is coming, and the plagues will be talked about if, you just, if you'll memorize this psalm. The plagues will be talked about. I know this is about mañana, but it's also about today. When the fowler is, ch is challenging your peace of mind and your security of heart, when he is challenging you, and some of you are being challenged big time right now. Nobody knows the story but you. You know it. When he's challenging you, one line to the fowler, he will guard me in all my ways. He will guard me. Eight words. I will put my trust in him, seven words, put the eight and the seven together. He will guard me in all my ways. I will put my trust in him. He'll take care of me. He will guard me. Personalize it. He will guard me. Personalize it in all my ways. When your private world melts down, he will guard you. When the world melts down one day, he will guard you. He will guard me in all my ways. He will guard me in all my ways. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. What the devil cut out is the bottom line to this metaphor. Thank you, devil. Thank you for drawing our attention to it. Now we won't forget it. He will guard me in all my ways. Say it out loud with me. He will guard me in all my ways. He will guard me. He will guard me. Wow. You have nothing to fear. I need to say this. You have nothing to fear. And the devil knows it. <laughs> the devil knows that you have nothing to fear, which is why he's so breathing down your neck because he's going to intimidate you into submission. He's going to intimidate you to break that trust with your Father in heaven, that forenamed God. He's going to break that trust if it kills him. 
Because he knows you have nothing to fear. Angels who excel in strength were surrounding Jesus, and those angels will be surrounding you. Any temptation that comes your way, he will guard me all my days. He will guard all my ways. He will guard you in all your ways. Wow. No matter what you're dreading in the future, no matter what, the devil knows. Angels who excel in strength. The Holy Spirit, who is the omnipotence of God himself, Almighty God, all four names inside of you. The Holy Spirit says, Dwight, what do, you, what, what, what do you have to fear? He's saying to you, whatever your name is, he's saying, hey, girl, what do you have to fear? You have nothing to fear. I'm in you. I will guard you in all your ways. You think I would forget you? I am the hen. I am the mother hen. Come, 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 come. Quick, quick, quick. Fire's coming. In the words of William Orcutt Cushing, under his wings, under his wings, who from his love, how's it go, can sever. Under his wings my soul shall abide, safely abide forever. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the truth of the mother hen metaphor and the truth that will save your life. He will guard you in all your way. I want to take an extra moment to thank you for joining us in worship today. It's by the continued support from viewers like you that we're able to bring you this program. Today I want to invite you though to share with us how this ministry has blessed you. I get inspiring notes, emails from viewers literally all over the world telling me, look Dwight, God has been blessing me this way. He's been doing this. I would love to hear from you as well. Just visit our website. You know it, newperceptions.tv and click on the contact link at the top of the page. Send me a note. Let me know what God has been doing right now in your life. Once again, thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll join us right here next time. And until then, may the God of grace journey with you every step of the way.